Okay, I'm going to quick uh, pick up what's happening here in, in five was about 30 years old. And for about five years, he'd been in exile in Bangladesh colony near Nippur on the Kabar Canal. You remember, they call it Kabar River or Canal, that irrigation canal that I mentioned in the first lesson. Now, in chapter one, we've studied, he's given this awesome vision of, a, of cherubim appearing in a storm cloud as bearers of the divine chariot. And this is just a really impressive picture. And I said that, you know, in our visual age where we've got, you know, Pixar and all these people who can do these tremendous special effects, it doesn't strike us with the same power that it would strike Ezekiel. And so here we have, he, he's given this, this image, and then above them he sees a throne, on a throne, he sees a representation of the Almighty God. So he first sees this, this cherubim carrying this, this uh, the chariot, God's chariot, and then above them he's given this representation of God, and it in itself is an awesome picture of the holiness and majesty of God. Then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, Ezekiel is commissioned as a prophet to rebels. He's being sent to people who are impudent, rebellious, hard-hearted, and it's not going to be a cushy assignment. So he's told that, that he's going to, have the, uh, he's going to be sent to prophesy to rebels. Then in chapter 2, verse 8 through chapter 3, verse 3, his, mess- his relationship to God's message is symbolized through his eating of the scroll at the command of God. You remember God gives him this scroll and says, eat it, and he eats it, and there are all kinds of, uh, you know, symbolic things going on in that. And then in chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, he is promised divine strengthening, and he's going to need it because he is going to be prophesying to people who aren't going to be drinking up what he's saying. They're going to be resisting it. And so he needs divine strengthening, and you and I need divine strengthening when we present the Word of God in a world that is offended by it. And that happens uh, quite often. Verses 10 through 15 of chapter 3, he's miraculously transported from his position at the Kibar Canal to Tel Aviv proper, to the exiles to whom he is to prophesy. Then in verses 16 through 21, God tells him that he's made Ezekiel a watchman or a sentinel for the house of Israel, and he explains the responsibility of that calling, and that's where we ended last week. He tells him what is involved, that you have to sound the warning. You're a watchman, and it's your duty and your responsibility to sound the warning. Well, in chapter 3, verses 20 through, 22 through 27, that's the final stage of his commissioning as a prophet. And I'm going to read those verses, and then after I talk about those, then I'm going to deal more with chunks Instead of just reading all the way through, I'm just going to deal with chunks and I'll tell you like, you know, verses 1 through 17 and talk about that without reading all the text. And if I don't do that, like I said, the book is a long book and I just don't think I can treat it the way I've treated some of the others. But let me read this one in in Ezekiel chapter 3, starting in verse 22. He says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he said to me, get up and go out to the plain and there I will speak to you. So I got up and went out to the plain And the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory I had seen by the Kabar River, and I fell face down. Then the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. He spoke to me and said, Go shut yourself inside your house, and you, son of man, they will tie with ropes. You will be bound so that you cannot go out among the people. I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be silent and unable to rebuke them, though they are a rebellious house." But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you shall say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whoever will listen, let him listen. And whoever will refuse, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. So Ezekiel here, in, this is the last stage of his commissioning as a prophet. He's told to go out, on, to, go out to the plain or valley. And he there again sees the glory of the Lord that he saw by the river. And he again falls down and he is reminded. God of his awesome glory and we ought never to forget the picture and the image and the truth of who God is his awesomeness his holiness his glory and never become too casual you know I understand fully that we are completely reconciled as Christians that he is our father and we are close to him and have a a relationship with him but we can get to where as McGuigan has said before where we think of God as our cosmic chum Okay, and there is a distinction here. There is always needs to be a reverence and an understanding and appreciation of God's holiness. And you see that clearly here in how he is shown, uh, he's shown to Ezekiel. Well, he's to be tied up. 
okay, probably here by friends or family. He's to be tied up in his house so that he couldn't go out, and he's to be deprived of speech by God. So here, here we have the first symbolic acts, but these acts are directed toward Ezekiel rather than to the, the other people, the people to whom, he's, to whom he's ultimately going to prophesy. This symbolism is directed to him. And so he's to be tied up in his home, probably family or friends are to do this, and then God is going to deprive him of speech, and this symbolizes some important things, I think, about his role as he begins his ministry as a prophet. When and where he prophesies is not his decision. This is what I think is symbolized by him being tied up, that he, that he doesn't decide when and where he prophesies. He has no freedom in that regard. He can only go when he is released. He is God's instrument. He doesn't make the call. He will go when God turns him loose, when God sends him. He is God's spokesman. So he will only go and prophesy. Uh, where, when and where he prophesies is not his decision. And also what he prophesies is not to be his own words. And I think that's what's behind this idea where God deprives him of speech. That he is to say only what God gives him to say. He's not to invent anything, and he's not to take a message from anyone else. That God is the one speaking through him. So he says, listen, you don't speak, you speak when I give you the ability to speak. You see, he is controlling him, and I think the message for Ezekiel is, you prophesy when and where I send you to prophesy, and you say only what I give you to say. Now that's good uh, teaching, instruction, for somebody who's be embarking on a prophetic ministry, just as Ezekiel is going to do. So I think the symbolism, the first symbolism he gets, I think is directed toward him. And then we have, in, in, again, God indicates that the response at the end there in verse 27, or, or toward the end, he indicates that the response that, uh, that he gets to the message, that's not his responsibility. And that, to me, is very comforting, and it's important to understand that he says, you put the word out. If they listen, they listen. If they don't, they don't. But you have to say what I give you to say, and then the responsibility for how they respond to it is on them. Okay, then in chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 7, verse 27, we're going to see, or, or, or chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 5, verse 17, there are these symbolic portrayals of the coming siege of Jerusalem. Now you remember it's 593. Jerusalem's going to fall in, in 587, 586. He's prophesying after he's been deported in 598, 597, but before Jerusalem falls finally, before it's destroyed. And so in, the, in 4, 1 through 517, you have these portrayals of the coming siege. And you can just see how this would strike people who are over here in, in this community that is exiled this is not what they want to hear. This is not what they want to hear. Well, God instructs Ezekiel in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He instructs him to portray Jerusalem on a clay brick or tablet and then to lay siege to it. In other words, he's to sit here and take this tablet or this brick and he is to draw Jerusalem on it. He portrays Jerusalem. So here it is. Here is the city symbolized by what he has drawn. And then he is to act out an attack on the city. He sits here and he puts, the, he puts that there. And then he makes models of the instruments of siege. He makes a siege wall, which apparently was used to protect approaching archers. He makes a siege wall and he makes an earthen ramp or a siege mound that was used to bring up the battering, the battering ram. You know how they would, you know, defenses of cities, that's why they had walls around them. So people couldn't just come in and attack the people and kill them. So you've built a wall around the city so when you're under attack, it gives you protection and your people sit up along the wall and shoot at people with arrows or do whatever else they want to do. And so you have that. And so part of ancient warfare is when they laid siege to the city, they would first cut the city off so nothing could come in or out. And this would go on sometimes for years. And so what happens? Well, they don't have, you know, if they don't have a source of water, they're in big trouble which is what Hezekiah's tunnel was about when he, he provided a source of water. But then they still have to get food in and out. And so they lay siege to it. Then also they have battering rams where they'll break down the walls. Now, they've got to be careful with that, right? Because you're a sitting duck when you're up here trying to do that. But the, the ancient warfare is this way. So he builds this model of the city. He draws this city. 
and then he lays, lays siege to it with the implements of ancient warfare. He builds this earthen mound, then he creates a battering ram, and he has military encampments all around. What do you think these people in Tel Aviv are thinking when, when he's doing this? They first think it's probably think it's strange that he's acting this way, but it, the, the point of it was is that it indicated to the inhabitants of this Jewish colony in exile that contrary to their expectations, Jerusalem would again be attacked by the Babylonians. It would again be attacked by the Babylonians. Over here in exile thinking, listen, this is it. You know, we've been spanked. Now we're over here. The city's still standing. God is going to bring us back in. Our nation is going to go on. He will be glorified. To him be the glory forever and ever. His temple is in Jerusalem. Nothing will ever happen to it. It is sacrosanct. He will not allow anything to happen to his temple. That he is there. We can rest easy. This is it. So you can see this message when he comes here and he does this. And he's saying, listen, Jerusalem is going to be attacked again by the Babylonians. The worst isn't over for that city. Oh, this is a bummer. I mean, this is a disheartening message to people who have already been exiled. But God tells him, you go and give this message. Now, in, Ezekiel, in addition, Ezekiel set an iron plate, a cooking pan between himself and the besieged city as he continued to stare at it. Okay, there are different views of what's being done here, but what I think this symbolizes is God's alienation from the city, and as he stares at it, is he's separated from them, but he's bringing judgment on it. Okay, he's cut off from the city. He has disowned the city. And he's bringing judgment on it as he sits here and fixes his stare at it despite this separation. Now, the message for the exiles was that God's blessings and fellowship are conditioned on faithfulness. See, the fact God had blessed Jerusalem and had, est and had established his temple there, those, those are obvious facts, truths, but those facts didn't mean that the inhabitants of Jerusalem could sin with impunity. The idea that we're here, you know, the Lord has blessed this city, he has established his temple here, so that means that we just, you know, foot loose. We just do anything we want to do. We sin any way we want because we are in the hideout. You see, we're in the safety zone. Nothing will happen. God won't let anything happen to us despite our wickedness. Now, the wickedness of the people, it had continued unabated during the reign of Zedekiah. You remember Zedekiah is the last puppet king that gets put on there? Then he finally rebels, and that brings the disaster of 587, 586. You'd think that after Daniel had gone out in 605, you'd think that after Ezekiel and Jehoiakim and the royal family and other people had been, been deported in 598, 597, that maybe the city would have said, uh-oh, we're being disciplined. But they didn't. They continued to sin uh, unabated during the reign of Zedekiah. And you can see that in 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 19 and 20. And see, God will not be mocked. Now, this is a lesson that, that has to be grasped, learned. He will not be mocked. Okay, he will not be treated, as I have said in other venues, as a cosmic chump. Or he's just sit here and, you know, look... I'm going to just take advantage of God and abuse him like he sits here and I can just play him, like, beat him like a drum. He's not going to allow that to happen. Look what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians, okay, he's writing to the Christians there and he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this also he will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh shall reap destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit shall reap life. So let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we shall reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, we have to understand this, that God will not be mocked. And that that's the message for us, is that we can't be deceived into thinking that being a Christian is a license to sin. Now hear me on this, okay? That it's a license to sin. Do Christians sin? Of course, I don't have to tell you that, right? You live inside of you. Do Christians sin? Of course they do. But do you see the difference between that and the idea of a license to sin? To say that, listen, God is into the grace business. He likes it. He loves it. So I can be casual about sinning. I can ho-hum it. It's no big deal. It shouldn't cut me and hurt me and drive me to repentance and really care about it. Nah, 
It's no big deal. The price has been paid. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead and don't, don't worry too much about sin. Okay? There is a difference, do you see, between a license to sin, an attitude that says, I now go ahead and sin freely. I sin without caring about it because I have a right to sin because Jesus died for me. There's a difference between that and the person who says, I have been freed and I am seeking to be what Christ wants me to be. I am imperfect. I fail. I fail. And doesn't lie about that. Doesn't sit here and say, no, no, I'm not sinning. Recognizes anger, selfishness, lust. All of these things are sinful and admits them. Okay, but do you see the idea, and I've used a picture before of the child who is trying to walk to his father. It is a much different picture of the little kid who's, you know, he's coming to his father and he's getting better and he's getting better than the kid who goes, Pfft. is there a different attitude there, you see? Now the kid who's coming, coming, seeking, falling, seeking, falling, seeking, falling is different. And when he comes to the father, can you imagine the father going, no. Okay, so this is, there's something about a genuine pursuit of godliness. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm not talking about, you think you've got to work your way to heaven? No, I don't. I think you have to be genuine. I think you have to be sincere. I think you have to be real. Otherwise, it's just lip service. You see, what does Jesus say in Luke 6, 46? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Anybody can make their lips go, Jesus is Lord. You just got to be able to blow, you know, wind. But there is a difference. If that confession is genuine, your life will be different and you will be pursuing Jesus Christ in his image. Will you fail? How many times do I have to say it? You'll fail. But can you be at peace in that pursuit? Yes. See, the flip side of it is people try to make, well, if you're going to be a Christian, the only alternative to license is to be a spiritual paranoiac. You just have to sit here and go, ah! or a neurotic. And you shouldn't be neurotic. You shouldn't be sitting here going, uh-oh, did I do that? Did I knock on that door? I'm gonna, Don't look, be at peace. Be at peace. But be real and pursue. Admit your failures. Don't lie about it. Don't hide it from yourself. Don't hide it from your brothers and sisters. Confess it freely. And then just get up. Okay, and that's what we all do. We all get up and we go on, but we're serious about it. We're not mocking God. It's not a joke. Do you see the concept? Okay, this is important. And this is what I see him saying to the people in Jerusalem. I have disciplined you twice. I have disciplined you firmly. And look how you're acting. You're thinking that, look, I'm here in the city. Nothing's going to happen here. Let's go ahead. And, you, and we keep reading. If you've read ahead, you know. You see the stuff they're doing. And you sit here and shake your head and say, how in the world can people be treating God like that? I'm going to tell you, culture has a tremendous impact on you. Okay? Culture has a tremendous impact on you. And you can see that, and, and we'll see it as we go on. Okay. I'll put up back that, that just wonderful map. Okay. So then he says, so in verses 1 through 3, you get this picture. Then in 4 through 8, now with Jerusalem symbolically under siege. Okay? He's done this portrait. He's laid siege to it symbolically. Then with, his, with Jerusalem under siege, Ezekiel lies on his left side for 390 days. Now, I don't think he did that continuously. Okay, be like he preached on Ephesians for two months. Okay, you understand he did it regularly. I think he did it maybe several hours a day. But if you want to think he stayed on his side for 390 days, 24-7, okay. He was there 390 days. And these days, these days represent 390 years of Israel's punishment for wickedness. You remember we have the two kingdoms when Solomon died, 930, he dies, 931 or 930. Shortly after that, the kingdom of, of Israel is divided, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Okay, so what he does here, he has him lie on his side 390 days, representing 390 years of Israel's punishment for wickedness. And he lies on his right side for 40, 40 days, representing 40 years of punishment for Judah's wickedness. Okay, well, what do we make of this? What, you know, what's he trying to say? Well, the point seems to be that contrary to the expectation of the exiles, they're over here thinking, look, we, this is about over. We're through with this. We're going to come back to our nation. It's all going to be just the way it was, unlike what happened to Israel, where the Samaritans came in and destroyed Samaria, ended the life of the nation, 
unlike that, we're not going to be like that. Well, the point seems to be that contrary to their expectations, Judah is going to suffer the same kind of punishment as Israel. In other words, its capital is going to be destroyed and its existence as a nation is going to be ended just as Israel's was. So I think that's, that's the point here. The only difference is going to be the length of that punishment. And the years of punishment, I think, when you, you have 430 days representing 430 years. Now, people disagree about this. But what I think is going on is that the 430 years, I think, that symbolizes captivity. That's what I think is in that figure because 430 years spoke to the Jew of Egyptian bondage. Okay, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 40, 41... See, that figure of 430 would say to the Jew, uh, captivity, bondage. So that's what I think is symbolized, and I think they're divided 390 and 40. Okay, yeah, 430, I think they're divided 390 and 40 because 40 years was the length of time that the Jews wandered in the wilderness as punishment for their unbelief and disobedience, and because Israel's years of exile would be significantly longer than Judah's. You remember when Israel went out in 722, 721. Okay, Judah is going to go out in 587, 586. Now, we've had two deportations before, but the, the blow, the death blow, is coming in 587, 586. Then in 539, when Cyrus the Persian comes and they, they conquer the Babylonians, you remember he issues the decree, you can go home. And so that's when this happened. So I think that's what's going on, but, you know, I, I, can't, I can't be certain about it. But when you have this 390 and 40 and you get 430, it's, it smacks to me, smells to me like that is a symbol of captivity. So he's saying that, and he splits them that way, I think, because Israel's captivity and its exile and deportation and destruction goes on significantly longer because it's from 722 whereas Judah goes into exile finally in 587, 586. Now, during these 430 days, or perhaps just during the final 40, okay, it's not really, not really clear, Ezekiel was required to stare toward the model that he had built. Okay, so he's, he's performing here, you see? He's performing, he sits here and people come and see, and he's acting out something, a prophecy for them. He's required to stare toward the model, and he was bound so that he couldn't turn his back on it. Okay, so somehow he's bound, he's required to stare toward that model during these days, and he can't turn his back on it, and that symbolizes God's determination to execute his judgment. He has decided. Okay, this isn't one of these deals. He is, he's determined to execute his judgment. He has forcefully decided that he is going to execute judgment on Judah. And at the same time, he prophesied against the city with a bared arm, Thereby, he's verbally announcing its fate, and he's symbolizing God's readiness to bring it about. And this bared arm thing seems odd to us, but you can see that symbolism in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10. It, it indicates we're ready to get down to business. Okay, so the, all of this he's doing, he's acting this out. Now, there is an implicit message of hope, I think. It's not the focus of it, but I think there's an implicit message of hope, and it was in the fact that the days of Judah's exile would end just as the 430 years of Egyptian bondage had ended. So I think tucked in there, we do see this implication of hope. But that's not the focus of it. The focus of it is to tell them, Judah, Jerusalem's going. Whatever you hear and whatever you're being told, it's going. And then in verses 9 through 17 of chapter 4, Ezekiel's daily diet, at least his public diet, okay, if, if somebody said to me, look, this was simply the diet, that, the diet that Ezekiel was allowed to eat in front of people. Okay, that would make sense to me. Okay, because this is something, this is, this is prophecy that is being acted out. But his, his daily diet, at least his public diet, during the 390 days, it consisted of rationed portions of a make-do type bread. Just some bread you kind of slap together, and he has rationed portions of that bread just a little over eight ounces or about eight ounces, and he has water that's a little over a pint of water. This is what he's eating. Some stuff he throws together, rationed portions, and he takes just a little bit of water a day. And Now, what this symbolized is the famine that would accompany the long siege of Jerusalem. Okay, and this is a fact God makes this clear in verses 16 and 17. There was a famine. Now, one of the things, if, I don't know how far I'm going to get, get to 
if you see nothing else, I want you to see how serious God is about sin. Now, when you see what he, you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us, right? He is the God of the flood, right? He killed all but eight people in the flood of Noah. You know, and now we, we turn those into uh, basic comedies. It's the greatest act of judgment in the world where he killed all of mankind but ate and killed all kinds of other things. So he is a God who takes sin very seriously. And if we get to it, I want to read just a little bit out of Lamentations. And when you think of what happened to Jerusalem because of its sin, the suffering you'll sit here and you'll be going, oh, oh man. And this, what we ought to get from that is not how could God, how could he? But how can we rebel against him and do something that deserves that? You see, he's very serious about sin. But he, he sits here and he, he, has, he symbolizes this famine. Now, God first directed Ezekiel. He first told him to bake this mixture over dried human excrement. And this would have apparently made the bread unclean. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 12 through 14, human excrement was to be buried. You weren't to have contact with it. So the priestly sensitivities of Ezekiel, this just freaks him out. He just really can't bear this. And God, in kindness to Ezekiel, he blunts the symbolism and he allows Ezekiel then to cook it over uh, animal excrement, which was just a common way. What, however that strikes us, that was simply a common way of cooking. Okay, so he relents and lets him do that, but we still have the full message because of what he's revealed. So, we get, so he allows Ezekiel in kindness to him to do that, but we still have the full picture. And the end of verse 17, it specifies that this is all due to the iniquity of the people. Let's not shift the blame, okay, to God. This is due to the iniquity of the people. God has brought judgment. He has been most patient. He has been very kind, very blessing, very appealing, disciplining, disciplining, calling, calling, Please stop, stop, change. I am God, I am God. Stop, 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 stop. And what do they do? Me, me, who are you, who are you? Drop dead, buzz off. God said, okay, I will not be mocked. My holiness will be vindicated. My holiness will be vindicated, and it is. Okay, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 17, okay, we have here the fate is portrayed through the shaving of his, head, of his head and his beard. What happens in these verses? See, God commands Ezekiel to shave his head and beard, which if, this was a humiliating act for a Jew. You remember the place where they captured some of David's people and shaved off what half their beards and cut off their pants, and this was like a, you know, this was bad news. But this was a humiliating act for the Jew, but he tells him to do that and then to carefully divide the hair into thirds. So he shaves his head, shaves his beard, and then he's to take the hair that he's got and he divides it up into thirds. When the 430 days of the symbolic siege are over, he then, he, he then uh, burns the first pile of hair. He chops the second pile of hair up with a sword. And then he scatters the third pile to the wind, chasing it with a sword. Now, can you imagine watching this guy? He burns the first pile. He chops the second pile up with a sword. He scatters the third pile and goes after it with a sword. And then he goes and collects some hairs that remain, tucks him in his garment, and then even some of those hairs he takes and throws in the fire. He sit there and go, hmm, what's this about? Well, this symbolized the fate of the inhabitants of Jerusalem as a result of the siege. This is what's going to happen to them. According to verse 12, you get a, one third would die from the, quote, fire of disease and famine uh, during and after the siege. One third would be killed in the battle for the city. And by angry, conquering soldiers, you know, when these guys after, a, you know, a two-year siege or whatever, whatever it is, when they finally get in there, you know, this was, this was a different world. They get in there and you've been making them sit out here and killing some of their people and doing this kind of stuff. When they get in there, you know, they're going to kill you. Okay, they may let some of you go, but look, the, you know, this is brutal. You know, I think about this stuff, you know, these days when, actually, I think of the Klingons, if you know, if you know. You know, Star Trek, warrior people. And that's why I think sometimes when, you know, you're ready to go out to battle and God says, yeah, the battle's yours, you're going to win. 
Now you go out and fight this psychopath sitting over here who's armed and all this. Well, why don't you just kill him? Why don't you, know, why don't you just kill him? You go fight. I'll give you the victory. Yeah. You see? But anyway, these guys, when they come in, so you have a third of them who, are, who die by disease and famine. You have a third who are killed in the battle for the city or by the conquering soldiers. And then you have a third that will flee the city. See, they're thrown up and they're being chased by the sword. Many of these are going to be cut down in the attempt. And even some of the relatively small group that survives, some of them are going to perish in exile. So it's not a pretty picture. And he's painting this for them, wanting them to see in the horror of Jerusalem's destruction, it's described in some detail. I know you've read Lamentations, if you go back just a little bit, from Ezekiel. Let me just read you just a couple of sections out of Lamentations. This is about the fall of Jerusalem. And it's not pretty. He says in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 7, he says, In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her destruction and laughed at her destruction, looked at her and laughed at her destruction. Jerusalem has sinned greatly, and so has become unclean. All who honored her despise her. For they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirt. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. There was none to comfort her. Look, O Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, O Lord, and consider, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look around and see, is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me, that the Lord brought on me in the day of his fierce anger? From on high he sent fire, sent it down into my bones. He spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He made me desolate, faint all along the way. My sins have been bound into a yoke by his hands. They were woven together. They have come upon my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. He handed me over to those I cannot withstand. Look in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. You could read the whole thing, actually, but, uh, and if you have, you know, this is just brutal. Okay? This judgment is, is something. He says in chapter 4, he says, Because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. Those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those nurtured in purple now lie on ash heaps. The punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. Their princes were brighter than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies more ruddy than rubies. Their appearance like sapphires. But now they are blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones and has become as dry as a stick. Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine, racked with hunger. They waste away for lack of food from the field. With their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. Now, we don't like that. See, we want to take this stuff out of the Bible because it gives, it's bad PR for God. It's bad press. We don't, we don't, let's slide that over here. And let, that's God. Okay? You know, we're not Marcionites, people who carve out the Old Testament and say, look, the Old Testament was written by an evil God. That's the evil God who's, who's involved in that. It's not Scripture. This is God. And what we are to see is His holiness. We have to see it. So that we not sit here and say, oh, well, look, you know, sin, I sin, you sin, we all sin. Who cares? Who cares? We can't be that way. Okay? We have to be serious. Because you see how serious God is. He's very serious about sin. Now, God declares that the horrible judgment on Jerusalem is because it rejected him. That is why. God placed Jerusalem in the center of the nations and established his temple there so it would be a beacon to the nations. It would be a light to the Gentiles, and instead of fulfilling its special place in God's plan, its inhabitants were filled with evil and did worse than the nations around them. So here God, he has given to Jerusalem this special role. 
He has given to Israel a special role. And instead of fulfilling that, they spurned his will, stuck their finger in his eye, said, who are you? I don't care. You know, these old stories that people told, what do I care about that? What have you done for me lately? And they just said, look, we're going to live on our own. We're going to do the way we want to do. And they live worse than the surrounding pagan nations. And God makes it clear that he's going to be vindicated. And that rebellious Jerusalem is going to be humiliated before the world. And when I read this, I think that, look, you and I as Christians, we have received more blessings than Jerusalem. Okay, we are children of God and heirs of eternal life. God calls us to live holy lives. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He calls us to let our light shine. He put Jerusalem there. You were to be a beacon. He puts us here and he says, let your light shine in a sin-drenched world that he may be glorified. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. So here we are to be beacons so that people who come into contact with the body of Christ, the church of Christ, that they say, these people are not of this world. Not that we're goofy. Not that we're you know, stupid or strange. But because we're holy. We love each other. When you read about the early church, one of the things that they freaked people out was how they cared for each other. They would take care of burying one another. They'd take care of the widows. They'd do things that the world would look at and say, what's the motivation for this? Why are you doing this? And the answer was, they have been in contact with Jesus Christ. They had been in, been in contact. They had been taught by their master to be this way. You know, you've seen the kung fu stuff, right? Guy always sits at the foot. Yes, master. You know, I want, to, I want to be like you, master. Teach me your ways, master. Well, we got the real master. And that's what disciples are. Disciples are people who sit at his feet and learn his ways. And so, that, you know, we need to be like this, and we need to be uh, people who act and glorify him. And if we, having been given so much, if we turn our backs on God, and I hate to say this happens sometimes, but if we turn our backs on God, having been given all that we've been given as Christians, there is a terrible judgment in store. He makes it clear in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through 22, and I'm sure other places. But we cannot have been given the blessings we've been given, the call that we have been given, and then spurn that, turn our back on God and simply think that, you know, hey, you know, what's it to God? He doesn't care. He's too big to care. He's not going to care. He's not going to judge au contraire. You got that? Au contraire. He is going to judge. Okay? He is going to judge. And if we can't see that from what he did to Jerusalem, we don't see what he did to Jerusalem. And when you read about it, you just sit here and go, you hold your head. I mean, really, when you sit here and you, you wince reading it, you just go, oh, man. What in the world? Look at the suffering, the punishment that he meted out. Why? Because they rejected him. As he pleaded with them and pleaded with them, was patient with them, bore with them, gave to them, blessed them. They just said, and then it's judgment. Chapter, in chapter 6 and 7, okay, Ezekiel repeatedly he preached the annihilation of Judah. You're going to see this. By the time we get to chapter 24, you're going to be saying enough already. Because he says it again and again and again. Different ways. He lets them know what's going on. But he repeatedly preached the annihilation of Judah so the message would have a chance of getting through to a stubborn people. Now these two chapters, 6 and 7, these are relatively straightforward predictions of doom and disaster. And you wonder why, you know, he needed strengthening. But when the message is like that, you know, we always, it's like anything else. We like messages that sit here and say, you know, they reinforce me, they make me feel good. What we don't like is the convicting word of God that comes into our lives and says, you're the man. You're the man. That's when we start saying, did God really say that? You know, you got people sitting there, well, is it, can you really trust the Bible? You know, see, no, I, I love the Bible when he's talking, you know, how much he loves me and all this. But when he sits here and tells me many years ago and says, listen, you want to be a Christian? You got to quit getting drunk. You got to quit getting stoned. You want to be mine? I didn't like that stuff. That's just part of living and having a good time. Well, he says, you pick. You pick. You're going to follow me or you're going to follow you. 
But what I don't want you to do is follow you and call it me. So you pick. So we don't like those kinds of things. But see, the word of God breaks into this world. And what we start doing is say, you really can't trust that word of God, you know. John had somebody tell him, maybe it was our dad, said that uh, you start reading the Bible, you go crazy. Is that what? He says, for a first sign of going crazy, reading the Bible. Okay, well, you see, but people start then saying, well, can you really trust that? And then they start hunting and say, well, you know, there's contradictions over here. You know, we really have trouble here. So, and all of this is, see, and it's like this, the serpent in the garden. What was his approach? Did God really say? See, did he really say? See, because what I want to do is I want to undermine the word of God so that when it challenges you, the question then is, I don't really think that's from God. But when it says stuff that I'm in agreement with, oh, praise the Lord, I like that. Now, what am I doing? See, that gives me the tool to carve the message of God into my image. I whittle away whatever I don't like and doesn't look like me, and I come out perfect, you see. But anyway, 6 and 7 here, he's telling him, he says, listen. But chapter 6 is judgment on idolatrous Israel. Now, this is, of course, this is understood to be Judah, what, was, what remained of old Israel when they were united. But idolatry was the standard way of worship in the ancient world. See, this was, how, this was how it is. It was believed that by making a likeness of a god or goddess that the deity could be brought close to a group of humans. This is what's going on in idolatry. Why all of these little models of gods are made. See, idols were believed to represent a god very similar to the way that a voodoo doll represents a person. Okay, you've seen that, where you make these little images of some guy, and then I stick him with something. See, what is done to the doll is done to the person represented by the doll. And that's how this works. All right, so you got no warning this time. That was the second bell. No, really the first. We're through. Thank you for coming. We'll pick up there next week, Lord willing.